Good morning from Tokyo. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to attend uh, this uh, seminar. So I welcome you all. Warm welcome to this uh, featured uh, speaker webinar uh, at ADBI. So we are very much uh, delighted to have Professor John Gibson uh, here with us. Uh, as you know, Professor John Gibson is a professor at the University of Waikato. My pronunciation is okay, Waikato. <laughs> and also he's a visiting professor at the Institute of Economic Research at Hitotsubashi University. And uh, last but not least, but maybe the most important for us is that uh, Professor John Gibson is now the uh, editor-in-chief of ADB, ADBI uh, journal called uh, Asian Development Review. So uh, today, uh, he will speak about secondary towns and poverty. Uh, this is very important issue for uh, developing member countries of uh, ADB and also the all parts of the global south in the world. So let me introduce uh, uh, Professor John Gibson a little more uh, in detail. So he's a development economist and uh, economics professor at the University of Waikato. His research is focused on poverty and the measurement of living standards in Asia and the Pacific. He is non-resident visiting fellow at the Asian Development Bank Institute and the editor-in-chief of ADR. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Stanford University. Okay, so there is a summary of the paper here, but uh, I think it's much better to ask Professor John Gibson to explain all of this uh, like himself. So, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Jimmy Mashte. If anyone logged in from New Zealand, kia ora. Um, I'm very, very pleased uh, to be here. I'm uh, very grateful for the kind hospitality, uh, and um, I look forward to having an interesting hour of, of talking about these. I should say, this particular talk isn't tied to a particular paper. Um, uh, two colleagues from ADB and I uh, do have a particular paper, which is specifically on Indonesia, which I'll be talking about tomorrow at the Institute of Developing Economies. So this talk is more of an overview of, of the broad literature in this area. And so let me just start. So we are already sharing. And so, what ties together um, this work is a focus on bringing, this, bringing urbanization and bringing our analysis of what happens in the transition from a largely rural population to a largely urban population, trying to disaggregate that in, in a way which can provide valuable insights for, for policy and also for, for analysis. Okay. And it's motivated by a sense that in, in some cases, the, the discourse about developing country urbanization, which is going very rapidly in, in Africa, going very rapidly in, in parts of Asia, going very rapidly in, in the Pacific, where I have a, a special focus, um, with not a lot of preparation for having very large cities. Um, quite a lot of my early work was in Papua New Guinea. Uh, Port Moresby is somewhere between 500,000 and, and a million. It's not clear how close to one million. It was not at all planned for anything like, uh, like that. My wife is from, from there and is an original landowner of that area. And there are all sorts of stresses on land markets, on infrastructure, on uh, sewerage, uh, water, electricity, which other parts of, of the ADB, ADBI region will, will know about. And so the discussion is often rural versus urban. Uh, it's a focus often on, on big cities because the, the policymakers 
typically are coming from, from big cities, from primate cities, capital cities, uh, donors are visiting those cities. Uh, we have reasonable data about those cities because we know where they exist and we have the wherewithal to track them, even if we rely mainly on administrative data such as censuses. Um, but what we don't necessarily know so much about is new urban growth points, which may pop up somewhere else. They may pop up near a natural resource, near transport infrastructure, uh, where, where people are congregating. They may be on the outskirts of big cities because people can't afford to live in the big cities. And so they, 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 they settle onto the outskirts and we'll talk about that. Uh, and what this literature is, is suggesting is, um, first of all, something not, not surprising, it's normally far cheaper to create jobs in secondary towns than in big cities, okay? The types of um, occupations and industries which are found in secondary towns are quite different than the ones in, in big cities. And so it's normally uh, quite a lot cheaper to create jobs. Uh, but very importantly, if we're focusing on detailed life history analyses are showing us that rural migrants find it cheaper and easier to settle into the secondary towns. The transport to get there is cheaper. The housing costs are far, far, far cheaper. Um, the possibility of finding jobs and through networks are, are cheaper. It may be that the secondary towns are a stepping stone to eventually moving into, into the big cities because we know that, that big cities tend to have higher productivity. Um, but because of this, and you'll see this in, in repeated ways, the, the growth of the secondary towns seems to do more, at least in the short to medium term, to have an effect of reducing poverty than does the growth of the, of the big cities. Let me just go through. Um, and it seems like a, a, there was quite a push on this theme in the lead up to, to COVID. And so there's a special issue of world development, which came out in 2018 with a collection of papers from a conference at the World Bank in 2016. Um, and there had been a considerable push by quite influential people such as Ravi Kamba at one stage was um, Chief of Development Economics at the World Bank uh, on this. Of course, during COVID, then in a sense, there was a little bit of a de-urbanization because people were not wanting to be agglomerating together. They were wanting to, to spread out. They were going back to home areas and so forth. But now as many countries are moving to a, to a post-COVID setting, uh, it's, it seems a good time, an opportune time to, to revisit this issue, okay? And so I'm not really a policy maker and I don't normally talk directly to, to policy people, but if there was one policy message to come through, it is that, um, a refocus of urbanization agendas towards the secondary towns, the smaller towns, um, relative to an emphasis on big cities may be well overdue. Now, of course, on one hand, we know from a, a rich vein of literature in, in urban economics, uh, in economic geography, that when we concentrate workers and firms together, um, they tend to be more productive. And there are a number of mechanisms for why that is, which I won't go through. I'll just give a, a single illustrative figure, which a co-author of mine did, did this calculation. Um, the elasticity of output per worker with city size. So if we've got cities of varying sizes and in, in the developed country context, you know, Tokyo all the way down to Kunitachi. Kunitachi, I think is 50 or 60,000. Um, Tokyo is tens of millions. Uh, we find that, Output per worker is higher in the larger the city, um, and the elasticity is somewhere between about 0 0.03 and 0 0.08, okay? Um, so what would this imply? Well, for example, if we look at a firm that was in a city of 5 million versus a firm in a city of 5,000, um, under that elasticity, the productivity of a worker could be maybe 23% higher in, in the big city. So wages are higher, output per worker is higher. But we know that in a lot of these uh, big cities, and, and Jakarta might be a prime um, uh, example, that we're starting to run into possible diseconomies of scale from congestion, of course, but also pollution uh, and other forms of environmental spillovers, such as um, subsidence from taking too much water out of, of the water table, flooding, which is then related to that subsidence. And so these may be limiting the agglomeration benefits. 
indeed, um, for, for I'm sure a variety of, of reasons, Indonesia is embarking upon a very expensive exercise to move the national capital to Nusantara on in Kalimantan, partly because of the issues which Jakarta is facing. And major cities throughout the ADB's region will be, will be facing these same issues. Even if it's not the case that these diseconomies dis of scale are occurring, at the distributional level, thinking about unemployment and poverty, it's quite possible that we can have big city growth without necessarily seeing a reduction in, in poverty coming from that growth. And so this goes back to you know, a classic model in economics of Harris and Todaro. It might be the case that people move to the big city based on the expected wage, which is an average of the actual wage they'll receive times the probability of, of receiving that wage. And if the formal sector is setting wages above equilibrium because they might be on, on government pay scales or, or multinationals may have code of conducts for workers in different, different countries, or for whatever reason that the wages in the formal sector are, are not being lowered by a, a, a long line of unemployed people wanting those jobs, um, then people will rationally queue for those jobs possibly by surviving in the informal sector of the urban economy. And depending on where the urban poverty line is, and it's typically quite a lot higher because of the high cost of living in these areas, then those people could well actually be moving from rural poverty to urban poverty. They haven't escaped poverty at all. And in some cases, they could even be moving into urban poverty, at least until they can get that stepping stone into, into the formal sector job. In contrast, in the smaller towns, the type of occupations is much, there are far fewer um, institutional factors which could lead to the wages being uh, too high above the equilibrium. So the labor market of small towns is likely to be more closely tied to the, to the rural labor market. And it's also more likely to be market clearing. And so in the smaller towns, and then in my paper from um, India, the late Martin Revalian wrote a very nice mini theory model for that paper, which showed exactly this in the, process of urbanization, at least in the initial to middle stages, there may be much closer links between the small town labor market and the rural labor market than between the big city labor market, because the big city labor market is affected by quite a few other, other factors which could do introduce this wedge, basically, or this disequilibrium. So what have been the types of studies that have tried to, to, to give us some empirical content for, for this idea that uh, growth of the smaller towns may, may have more impact on um, poverty reduction. There's been three broad types and, and one um, actually with a, a link to, to Tokyo. So Luke Christiansen from the World Bank and uh, Yasuyuki Todo, who's at, I think, Wasada University here in Tokyo, had a paper just on a decade ago. Um, I'll, I'll give one slide to talk about that. They use cross-country data, um, but they disaggregate into different types of, of population groups to look at the links to, to poverty. There are a set of papers very heavily concentrated on Tanzania, where there's been a very rich micro data set tracking people over 20 years, the Kagura Health and Development Study. And so these are tracking studies are seeing where rural migrants go. Some go to big cities, some go to other rural areas, some go to secondary towns and they look at their outcomes, okay? So it's very, very detailed. It includes some life history analysis um, from, from very small samples. The third set and the third set of the studies I've been involved in, I'll describe as city level. So we're not using national level cross country data. We do these within a particular country. So we hold the, the rules and the institutions and so forth are common, but we look at different types of urban areas and we do that because we're going to rely on remote sensing, which in some sense can give us a richer um, data possibility than we may get from the usual administrative data. Um, and so uh, one of these for India and one for, for Indonesia, the one for Indonesia being with the two colleagues from ADB. So, so the cross country studies very briefly. So um, Christiansen and, and Todo, they take a panel based on household surveys and this panel is on average four waves per country for 51 countries. About one third of these countries are from the ADB region. Um, and what they do is they look at the share employed in agriculture and they look at the share living in cities above one million 
And between those two, there's a, what they call the missing middle. Okay, and this missing middle is the rural non-farm economy and the secondary towns. So it's people living in the countryside but not involved in agriculture anymore, or it's people who have moved out of the countryside but not into the big cities and into the secondary towns. And what they found was that the, the larger was this, this missing middle section, um, the greater actually was the um, reduction in poverty and the more inclusive were the, were the growth patterns. Um, Whereas in contrast, the agglomeration, which was concentrated more on metropolitan, on, on big cities, was actually associated with higher inequality. And so metropolitan driven agglomeration on average was less successful at reducing poverty than overall urbanization. And so it was growth, but without, without poverty reduction in some sense. In, in the tracking studies, and, and I'll give um, a few slides to these because there's been several several studies and key authors of these have been uh, Ravi Kamba, uh, Yohim Dubura, who's now at IFPRI in, in Malawi, previously at um, um, KU Loven uh, with um, um, uh, jo, jo Swinnan, who's now the head director of IFPRI. And so Kagera, which is an area of uh, Tanzania, which is very close to the, the Rwanda, Uganda side. So it's almost as far away from Dar es Salaam as possible. Um, very detailed health and development study modeled on the World Bank Living Standards Measurement Studies in, in the 1990s. Uh, they went back in 2020, 2010, sorry, and they tracked as many of the people as possible. And of course, many people had split off from their original household. So many people moved to other rural areas because they'd, they'd grown up and they'd, they'd married and so they'd moved into their, their um, husband's family or their, their wife's family, depending on, on the, the tradition there. And so they were able to distinguish between people who moved to other rural areas, people who moved to towns versus people who moved to cities. And cities were Dar es Salaam and uh, Dodoma, I think, were the two big cities in, in Tanzania for this analysis. And what they found was that it was true that the people who moved to cities individually had the largest fall in the risk of being poor. So the poverty rate for the people who moved to the big cities fell 42 percentage points. That's an extremely impressive um, uh, rate of poverty reduction. But the problem was that this is a very small group who were able to make that move. And so on this bar chart, the width of the bars is roughly proportionate to the size of, of the, the flows and the size of the groups. And so the moves to city scales are negative numbers. So the headcount poverty rate went down by 42% for those people. But in aggregate, it was the smallest contributor to poverty reduction from all of the contribution coming from human mobility because it was restricted to only a very few, you know, only perhaps the, the most ambitious, the most uh, able, the most well-connected, the most entrepreneurial, the most risk-taking migrants were able to do this. Far more, three times as many of the rural to urban movers moved to towns rather than to cities. And even though in this data set, they didn't have individually as much of a reduction in the risk of poverty in the aggregate, this was um, twice as much contribution to overall decline in poverty coming from moving to towns versus moving to cities, because it was a more feasible move, okay, whereas the move to cities is, is just a less feasible move for, for many people. And similarly, but over a far shorter period, at the national scale, Tanzania has a, a national panel survey, so this only was tracking people over four years, 9% of the population were, were migrants out of this uh, panel. And the rural to secondary town cases were again twice as many as the rural to big city uh, movers. Again, it's, it's just a, it's a relatively rare thing to be able to move from a rural area directly to a big city. And the moves that involved the secondary towns, either as the destination or as the stepping stone to eventually moving into a bigger city, uh, generated 88% of the national poverty reduction due to mobility. The big city moves generated only 32%. These add up to more than 100 because there were some moves that actually raised poverty and the moves that raised poverty were people who moved from secondary towns back to the rural areas. 
So in a sense, sometimes a logical proof, we want to do something in reverse to see if it reverses. When they moved from the secondary town back to the rural area, we don't know the reason why, but actually they went back into poverty on average. Uh, whereas when they moved from the rural area to the secondary town, they'd gone out of poverty. And so this was the biggest, biggest contribution. And so again, the same, um, the same uh, story here, the uh, width of the bars is proportionate to the size of the flows. And so the move to the towns, the green bar is a far and away the largest contribution to that um, short-term reduction in poverty. Um, so what's some implications from these uh, very micro tracking studies? Well, even though the move to a big city can be highly productive, as we would predict based on what we know about agglomeration economies. Um, it's a relatively rare move because the big city is inaccessible for many poor rural people. The costs to reach the big city are much higher. They had very nice data in um, uh, their paper in World Development on this where they got transport costs from various rural areas. The costs of housing, of course, are far, far higher in, in the big cities. And this is partly because um, ADB knows for, far more about this than I do, and I'm sure ADBI also knows far more about this than I do. The provision of infrastructure, the, the, the mobilization of urban land, all of these make it extremely expensive to, to build mass housing for, for big cities in, in developing countries. And so uh, it's very high cost housing. And the unemployment rate is considerably higher in the big cities than in the, in the smaller towns. And so again, these, these tracking studies uh, indicate that the, the moves to the secondary towns in aggregate were, were contributing more to the overall poverty reduction. Now, how about the, the, the work that I've been involved in? And so I'll talk um, particularly about the uh, paper from, from India. Um, and what we do in this paper is we disaggregate cities in two ways. We disaggregate cities according to size. And so we break out the cities which are above 1 million in, in population. Um, and then we also disaggregate cities according to the way they're growing. Are they growing outwards, what we call the extensive margin, which we will observe from an expansion in their lit area, or are they growing upwards, which I should caveat the data we have. There are actually remote sensing data which could very accurately tell us the upward movement as well. Um, our data are not quite that accurate, but it's being proxied by are they becoming brighter, are they becoming more intensely lit, which is consistent with greater population density. And in, in Indonesia, we, we use very much the, the same, same approach because we want to, to, to draw links to it because the policy conclusion was that it was the expansion of secondary towns on their extensive margin, which was based, which could be called urban sprawl, and in another literature, many people would be worried about that because of the loss of cropland and other farmland was actually the most closely associated with poverty reduction. And so because that could be potentially a controversial um, conclusion given various actions to protect farmland and to restrict um, conversion of farmland in, into a built up urban area, then we wanted to do things as closely as possible for Indonesia, where these issues are also very paramount um, uh, to see if we were getting the same result. And so one of the great advantages about the remote sensing approach is we can define cities no longer by administrative boundaries because the administrative boundaries are often outdated and a lot of the growth is occurring outside of the administrative boundary. But we can basically define them in functional terms by the way that the spatial pattern of lighting is developing. So if, if cities are developing along transport links, then we can observe the, the, the growth of the cities in, in this way. And you'll see some pictures of that. There will be some pictures. I know I looked at some of the ADBI talks. Uh, there are eventually it gets to be quite a few pictures and charts. It's a little bit heavy on, on text compared with some. Um, that's what happens when you have academics come along. Um, so why, why cities with night lights? Well, basically artificial light is always present wherever urban areas develop. We're less comfortable using it for modeling rural areas, even though some other people have done that, because the type of lights that the satellites can detect are basically huge, big street lights. They're not incandescent bulbs or fluorescent tubes that we might have in a village. They're 10, 20 kilogram lights of a particular type, but they are very closely associated with, with urban development. Um, previous World Bank study for Indonesia 
uh, of the 21 most populous uh, cities at that stage, only four of them were solely within one, one administrative area. And much of the growth was outside the boundary. So it seemed as if the city wasn't growing because the growth simply wasn't being recorded in, in the usual statistics. And as I said, secondary towns can often pop up in the gap between a census, especially if a country has a census every 10 years, then there could easily be a new, new growth pole coming and a secondary town developing. And it's not clear that it would always be enumerated by statistics officers. They'll enumerate where they've already been in the past, and they may continue to map that area between a census as they prepare for field operations, but they won't necessarily know about these, these new areas in the same way, whereas the satellites can, can detect these um, quite, quite effectively. So what we do, and it, it looks a little bit like a, um, um, uh, a fried egg, um, is for big cities, we start with a pre-known central point that we expect to be very brightly lit. So Tokyo Station. Okay, somewhere where we think there's going to be a high density of activity, and then our algorithm will spread outwards, looking at the lights until it finds places which are less brightly lit than a threshold that we set. It will look around, see if it's it's just got a little, you know, like a park or something, and it'll skirt around there and look for it. If it finds nothing else, it will say, and so so for every big city, we're able to to find its ultimate size. And we will do that in the year that we stop analyzing. The assumption is cities are growing, but they're not shrinking. So this may not work so well in the United States and Detroit, for example, which is starting to, to, to decline. But in growing cities in the ADB region, it, it seems perfectly sensible. And we reserve all of the space that the big city eventually takes for its future growth. We don't allocate any of the lights we see there in the interim to the big city uh, to, to the big city or the secondary town. For the secondary towns, because we don't know where all of them are, we don't have a master list at the start of the exercise, then all of the areas that are in, illuminated above a threshold um, within, a, within a district or within a regency in, in Indonesia or in India, it's an NSS region, which is a collection of districts, five or six districts of similar nature, then we'll illuminate, we'll count all of those, and you'll see a picture of that in a second. Okay. So one thing you have to be careful of in doing this is if you set the threshold low enough to detect a lot, then you'll get cities which seem to be extremely huge. And so this is New Delhi, all of the way up to Chandahar, which is, um, I think I've put it here, it's 250 kilometers away. But at a sufficiently low threshold of, of brightness, there is actually a lit corridor all of the way up India's National Highway 1. Okay, so we don't really want to use that as a threshold because it would make it seem as there's only a very few cities all, all tied together over these very sinuous networks. On the other hand, if we go to a very demanding threshold of brightness, quite a few cities drop out. So Kota, which is a city of over a million, um, at the 100% brightness threshold actually, actually doesn't get picked up by, by the satellites. It's simply not bright enough. Delhi is bright enough. Um, Marut, which is now really an extension of, of Delhi, is bright enough, but um, it doesn't. So, so we use cross-validation where we were typically choosing about 50% brightness to set the boundaries for the, for the big cities. And then uh, this looks like, a, a again, it looks maybe like a, a sort of a bacteria or something like this. This is Bangalore, and we're showing boundaries at various stages of Bangalore's development. And the usual nighttime light series start in 1993, carry forward, or 1992, carry forward until 2013. So the, the star in the center of that was the starting point for, for the algorithm for measuring Bangalore. The green colored was the extent of Bangalore in 1993, the black outer edge was Bangalore by 2012, the expansion that way. And so we reserve all the space between that for growth of the big city over time. The blue um, dots all around, those are secondary towns. Those are urban areas that are sufficiently illuminated, but they're not connected directly to, to Bangalore. And so in this particular case, we've got a set of secondary towns and there's more, I just didn't want to put arrows everywhere, um, which are doing that. Now, why do we want to do that? Because sometimes here we've got Bangalore and, and um, excuse my pronunciation, uh, Combatore. Um, and so these were both big cities. 
both of them were growing at a roughly the same rate of around about 4.6 to 4.9 percent and when we say growing their area was expanding over time but they were growing in quite different ways and so the NSS region that Bangalore is part of is inland southern Karnataka and in that case um, Bangalore was 35 percent of the total growth of that region okay so it was was growth um, focused on the primate city whereas in inland Tamil Nadu, then most of the growth was actually outside of the primate city there. Most of the growth was coming in other parts of the, um, of the NSS region, even though the two primate cities were growing at roughly the same rate, 4.6, 4.9% per year. In addition, you have some um, cities, and so uh, Theresa um, at the very bottom of the diagram was actually growing very, very slowly, only a 1% to 2% per year. So we get variation in the rates that cities are growing, but we also get variation in the mix of growth, sometimes concentrated on the big city, sometimes coming from, from the secondary towns. And that enables us to then look to see what sort of growth is being associated with uh, the poverty reduction. Now, when we do the same exercise in both countries, in Indonesia and in India, we find the secondary towns are growing fastest. And so they're growing both in terms of lit area, but also in lit area times brightness, what we call the sum of lights. And so whichever way we measure them, they're growing faster, especially so in, in Indonesia. I should say in the period prior to what we're studying here, Indonesia's urban expansion rate had actually, after the um, 1997 Asian crisis, had slowed down dramatically. So this was not um, one would not want to extrapolate backwards from these rates because it was actually a very large step change in Indonesia's rate. Um, but again, we see in both cases, secondary towns were, were growing more rapidly. The other key feature of these is it's important to not only allow effects on your own area, but there may be effects on neighbors because it could be that migration patterns are such that people from neighboring regions come to particular towns. Um, and so the growth of those towns may affect not only the own region, but may affect neighbors. This will depend on transport infrastructure, geography, uh, migration flows, settlement patterns, where networks exist and so on and so forth. And so we want to allow for um, what we'll call spatial spillovers using, using particular form of modeling. And why we would want to do this is because when we look at poverty in many of the ADB uh, region countries, then we find very clear spatial non-randomness. And so this was India at baseline for our study. And if you can see a black dotted line going up on a diagonal, it's going up from um, uh, Nashik in uh, Maharashtra to Kampur in UP. And everything to the southeast of that line is given the color red, orange, yellow, and those in my maps, and all the maps were drawn by, by my wife, I'll thank her for that now if I forget later. Um, those, those are the stoplights. Those are the ones where things are not doing so well. Green is, is, is the ones where poverty rates are either lower or rates of poverty reduction are faster. So green, good, red, bad in a very simple form. So the only exceptions to that pattern are surrounding Kolkata, surrounding Chennai and surrounding Bangalore. Those immediate regions were, were lower poverty and they also escaped poverty faster. But everywhere else in that southeast of that line, um, Bihar and, and places like that were, were much higher poverty and much slower escapes from poverty. Everything to the northeast or along the Arabian coast was much lower poverty. And so this non-random spatial pattern suggests either that there are important things we're leaving out or that there are important interactions. It's very hard to be rich when your neighbors are all poor. And likewise, if your neighbors are all rich, it's actually quite a lot harder to be poor because of the interactions you can have with those rich neighboring areas through, through trade, through labor migration and so on and so forth, okay? So we want to take effect, account of those patterns. Very much the same in Indonesia, where it's a west to east pattern, where the poverty rates are much higher in Eastern Indonesia. The exceptions to that, along um, generally uh, low poverty islands are very remote parts of those islands, okay? Um, uh, Asia and so forth, okay? So we take account of that. When we do that, um, and there's no, there's no regression tables, there's no equations, I'll, 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 I'll not have anything too technical there. So these bar charts are again, we hope for larger values below the, net, below the zero axis because this is the rate of 
poverty decline that is occurring. And so we see for the big cities, um, for um, India in this particular case, for the headcount index or the poverty gap index, the um, error bars are 95% confidence intervals. We can't rule out zero relationship between the growth of the big cities and the decline in poverty. Whereas for the growth of the secondary towns, whether we're using a headcount, but particularly for the depth of poverty, the poverty gap index, then there's a far stronger association between the secondary town growth and the decline in, in poverty there. The same thing in um, Indonesia, the big city growth is surrounded by very wide confidence intervals, the relationship between the big city growth and the poverty reduction, whereas the secondary town growth, again, gives us statistically significant um, relationships between the faster are the secondary towns growing, the greater is the overall poverty reduction. And much of this is coming through the indirect effects. And so in this chart here, we're decomposing the overall negative effect we showed for India before, um, and we're decomposing it into the direct effect, which is the effect of growth in the urban area in my own district or my own region versus the indirect effect, which is allowing for spillovers where I may benefit from growth somewhere else. Because maybe there's a history of people from my area going to a, a town quite a long way away for, for seasonal labor migration. Maybe there's trade routes or infrastructure that connects us. So in the, the India case, the direct effect is only one quarter and the indirect effect is three quarters. And again, that stems from the, the non-random pattern of, of poverty. The same, the same is true with Indonesia. Okay, so um, uh, we, we said uh, sort of finish about 2022, so there's time for Q&A. So I've got um, two, two concluding slides. So these studies that I've covered, some I've been involved with, uh, some that I've not, um, have been predicated on the sense that there may have been a little bit too much emphasis on the on the big cities. And we can understand the the the, the reasons why um, big cities can be front of mind for, for policymakers and for, for donors uh, when they're discussing allocation of public resources or allocation of, of uh, donor resources. Some of it's also coming from researchers like myself, because we've been quite successful in showing that big cities are more productive. We've been quite successful at showing that, you know, there's more innovation in big cities than in secondary towns. There are more um, discoveries and more patents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's more, you know, national universities are normally in, in the big cities, the, the elite education and so forth is there. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into the biggest bang for the buck in terms of, of poverty reduction compared with uh, what may happen with the secondary towns. So the, the strategy of the researchers to try to correct this possible bias has to disaggregate urbanization along a spectrum. And we can use novel tools such as remote sensing to do this in ways we couldn't easily do it with the standard administrative data, certainly not with the high frequency of, of data available every year or data available to match the household surveys which are providing us with the, the poverty information. Okay. Um, so for, for, for policymakers who may be tuned in, um, then paying more attention to, to the development of the secondary towns, um, thinking about the, the, the points where big cities might be reaching congestion limits, where actually the diseconomies of scale are starting to come in, um, thinking about the, the, the negative spillovers from pollution, congestion, uh, you know, resource use, uh, subsidence, flooding, and so on and so forth. Um, because by adopting this more disaggregated perspective, then it may lead to important policy orientations, but it can also lead, I hope you found the talk interesting, it can lead to interesting analyses of patterns which we otherwise may not have seen. So for people who are interested, um, there are some, some, some key references. Um, world development really has been um, quite, quite central in, in, in this. It's now a new editorship, editorship team. I'm not sure if the new team will be as interested as the old team were in, in this particular um, issue. Um, of course, we hope Asian Development Review will get papers along those lines as well. Um, and of course, my um, uh, very little of what I presented, I've done by myself. I've had a lot of um, very helpful co-authors and also very helpful um, funding. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it was very interesting presentations. And uh, I think everybody here enjoyed. So we'd like to move with the Q&A if anybody has any questions. Thank you for allowing going me first. Professor Gibson highly enjoyed. I'm interested in nightlight data because I do research on uh, developing member countries who have lack of data and nightlight data really a saver. Um, so for I see how you showed poverty. What would you recommend other areas um, for studies using nightlight data, especially uh, those which relevant to ADB priority areas like infrastructure, climate, poverty you mentioned, uh, gender, like these topics. Thank sure. you. Um, sure, that, that's a very good question. So so in other work we've, we've done, and, and these particular papers we've used a set of nightlights data which were originally um, designed for US Air Force pilots. So they were not designed for, for people like us. They were not designed for even for researchers. Um, and so as a result of that, it is um, somewhat... Um, fortuitous that they actually do reflect patterns on the ground because that wasn't what their, their function was at all. Those data mostly ended in, in 2013, but have recently been extended through to at least 2019. For if you're not constrained by, by time periods, if you're looking at a more modern, newer development, there's a newer set of research focused nighttime lights data, which we've shown in some other papers probably do a far better job of measuring uh, inequality, uh, measuring urban development. They still struggle to measure development of low density rural areas because there's not very little of the activity that occurs in those areas, which is, is directly lit at night. So agricultural activity by and large doesn't require, and the density of the population is sufficiently low that there isn't the need for the types of lights which can actually be detected from space because they can't really detect village lights or individual household lights. And so they're extremely good for studying urban areas, for studying infrastructure such as transport networks. Um, they're actually very useful for studying off, off land issues because ships are a very important source of lights, particularly for fishing, but also their own navigation. So there are very good um, 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 data sets for looking at um, uh, the movements of ships and, and so forth. Uh, the queuing of ships outside of China's ports during the sort of the slowdowns and lockdowns were picked up by these sources. Um, so so they, they're very useful in that way. I would caution against sort of thinking about them for the rural areas. There is some evidence that daytime imagery can pick up some parts of rural areas better, such as in some countries, simply having an iron roof is a good proxy indicator for having access to, to cash or access to, to migration networks and fund that as opposed to having a, a traditional route, like a thatch roof or a grass roof or something in that sense. Thanks, John. John, uh, uh, I have two questions uh, from online, but before that, I have uh, one quick question for you. Uh, for example, you said like uh, the secondary towns are very crucial in terms of reducing poverty, but how do you account for those people who lives in the secondary town and work in the cities. And these are the people who have actually moved out of poverty than yep. those and the others. So, so, so that's, a, that's a prime example of one of the, the constraints, which is the, um, the, the costliness of housing in, in big cities. Now, of course, that's, some of that's a natural feature. It's, of course, a feature of developed countries as well. But part of it is because of difficulties of um, generating sufficient infrastructure for housing development, um, land mobilization, uh, land compensation for traditional landowners, a very sore point in, in some, some, some settings. And so because we, I shouldn't say, we, because many developing countries have found it difficult to, to house populations in large cities at the rate in which people would like to move there for, for opportunities and productivity reasons, then people exactly, as you said, are settling on the outskirts and, and commuting in. And, and the commutes could be you know, one hour, more than one hour each day. Um, and of course, this is, this is very costly from their livelihoods uh, because it's taking away time that they could be earning. It's taking away time if they've got children and they're also making those transitions for schooling or if they're schooling somewhere else then the human capital is being affected by that as well. So um, in some sense, it reflects the frictions for having greater growth of the, of the big cities. Uh, I'll just take one question from the floor before. Uh, 
Okay, this is uh, from Dr. Sitaram, he's our colleagues. Uh, he says, thank you for insightful research finding. How has the access to digital infrastructures in rural areas impacted rural urban migrations of worker, especially in countries such as India? How does this impact compare with the impact of social infrastructures such as water sanitation in rural areas? So that's that's a really good question. So, so we know from um, uh, some um, very um, well publicized experiments where uh, researchers have overcome, well, overcome some of the constraints that rural workers may have for accessing urban labor markets. So for example, providing information, providing bus tickets and so forth. And in many of these cases, the, the intervention is relatively low cost and yet people haven't been able to overcome those barriers themselves. So something suggests that either the, the perception of the earnings opportunities or the net gains from, from, from um, moving to those denser labor markets are not filtering through, uh, or there are other constraints on people. Because I, I think particularly there was a paper on seasonal migration in Bangladesh, um, uh, Mushfiq Ahmed uh, and colleagues uh, did this paper. I think it came out in Econometrica ultimately. And the, the intervention was, was bus tickets and information. And the bus tickets were relatively cheap in that case. I know from uh, my own work a few years ago in, in the Pacific uh, with, with David McKenzie, where we have um, uh, workers from Pacific Islands accessing uh, Australia, New Zealand, the US. We don't know so much about the US, but we know quite a lot about because we've done surveys in Australia and New Zealand. Um, in these countries, the, the Australia and New Zealand television news show in the local countries because they don't have very many TV stations themselves. Most people have relatives in there. And we did wage expectations questions and people were people in the in the potential labor sending areas were very poorly informed about the um, the actual gen the, the wage distribution in the destination. They were very poorly informed, for example, that um, there was a substantial gender gap in the wages and destination, which was not present in source. So many of these people who are contemplating working, uh, moving, sorry, had say public sector jobs, uh, policemen, uh, other where there were salary scales, which were evening up gender gaps, but they were moving as migrants to quite um, uh, biased, gender biased occupations. And so the men were not getting professional work straight away. They were working in construction. Uh, the women were working in is maids, cleaners, and things like that. And there was a huge gender difference between these. So they were going from a setting which didn't have a big gender gap to one which was going to have a big gender gap for the types of jobs that they were likely to access in the short run. They had very little um, expectation of that occurring despite the full, almost full information there. So it does suggest that there's something more than just information. And so to the extent that digital infrastructure is improving information, that by itself may not be enough to, to, to promote those moves. So. Thanks, John. Any, any questions? Well, thank you very much for the excellent uh, uh, presentations and the Q&A. Uh, my question is about the Karek region, so Central Asia. Is there any related studies about that region? Because uh, the region, it looks different because a lot much less uh you know uh, congestion yeah. but uh, do you think uh, it, so one question is uh, is there any good studies uh, in that region and another is uh, do you think the mechanism is uh, similar like uh, agglomeration economies these economies and spillover effects but the uh, extent of the, each of these effects is just smaller yeah. So, so that's an excellent question. So, so there are um, certainly using these sorts of data sources, there are quite a few studies, not very often in, in economics, I must say. Um, I see quite a few studies from, from having sort of published in this area, I get quite a few requests to review in say the remote sensing area. Uh, and there are a lot because of Belt and Road. So there are studies which are looking at the growth of Central Asian uh, cities or associated with, with say Belt and Road initiatives and so forth. I think one of the differences about those, those um, cities is because of the, the, the centrally planned past, then the nature of agglomeration economies may be different than um, cities which have developed in sort of a, 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 a more organic, perhaps less organized way. Um, and so I, I'm not, I haven't seen economics literature on that, but that just 
comes to mind as, as one possible uh, likelihood. The other important thing I do know about that area is the, the key importance of, of remittances uh, for much of that area. And so again, that may drive um, some of the development because it may be that certain cities are, are better um, beachheads or better launching points for accessing overseas uh, opportunities for the incending remittances. And then of course, the development prom promoted by the remittances may tend to stay somewhere around there rather than filtering back as well. And so I think remittances are a really key thing to think about in those particular countries. Any questions from the floor? Yes. The similar process of the emergence of the sprawling of a secondary city uh, took place in Japan as well. So I myself uh, was born in 1960 and then really experienced that process. So it's easy for me to understand or you know even foresee what will happen in the Asian uh, other Asian countries, uh, except for Karek region. But uh, uh, what was my question? Oh, the, the Japanese way was to make a kind of uh, kind of satellite cities because I, 1996 or even 1950, late 1950s, after the economic uh, GDP level or GDP per capita or GDP as a whole uh, returned to the pre-war peak in the middle of 1950s, and then. Already in the 1958, 1959, uh, the growth rate was uh, declining. And then 1960s, there was a uh, uh, kind of announcement of income doubling uh, plan. It was actually a big infrastructure project. So existing industrial zones uh, or areas, uh, four places, uh, Tokyo, Greater Tokyo, uh, Nagoya, uh, Osaka, Kobe, and the uh, northern part of Kyushu. But those areas are already congested. Uh, in Tokyo, it was said that uh, making uh, appointment is uh, meaningless because nobody can keep. <laughs> Just like uh, uh, ten, 20 years ago in the Bangkok or the, now the you know, Dhaka kind of situation same situation. And then the J Japan's uh, income doubling plan was make uh, satellite cities of e around the existing uh, industrial areas. And then the create a new industrial cities between the existing ones. And then between or between like, like this. Yeah. And then eventually the, the those industrialized uh, areas became one belt. So that's uh, called the Pacific industry belt. So that's a kind of gradual way <laughs> taking advantage of agglomeration economies while solving the this economy uh, congestion problem. And then the, the smart people thought it would be impossible to create a uh, uh, new big city uh, in the remote area. It would be too difficult. So, but now Indonesia uh, exactly. building the new capital city. So uh, which is a better way? That's, so, so that's a very good question. And, and of course, um, um, as, as you know, my co-author on the paper on Indonesia is, is very closely associated with the development of Nusantara. And, and it will be what we would call a natural experiment. There have been papers looking at Brasilia as the same, same thing. Uh, Canberra in Australia, except it occurred 100 years ago, so it wasn't really dated. I'll give one example from my own country because off, often is perhaps too strong. Um, unexpected events can can change the trajectory. And so, in the nineteen early nineteen seventies, uh, Christchurch, which is uh, the second equal largest uh, city now, three hundred fifty thousand, about two hundred fifty thousand then, um, was becoming congested by New Zealand standards. And so, they built a, a satellite city to the south called Rolleston. But everyone. Uh, voted with their feet and started settling to the north instead of the south. So, so Rolleston stayed very, very small um, until uh, 2011 and the Christchurch earthquake, which devastated large parts of, of the central city. And it led to a much more spread out 
um, population people were less wanting to live in higher density areas because of, of the earthquake damage and so much of the city itself had been damaged they moved out to there uh, but the thing which had really first of all prevented the growth of, of Rolleston was that 1974 suddenly oil prices became double what they were unforeseen and people didn't want to pay for long commutes from the, the satellite cities 20, 20 minutes ago whereas previously when it was was cheap petrol cheap gas you said oh well that's a I'm trading off a little bit of time for a lot more space and it's not very costly. So things like commuting costs, things like petrol costs, things like natural disasters, which change the desirability of living in, in dense places. COVID would be another example of this. All have, in a sense, unforeseen effects on the, the trajectory which particular cities will do, which is why it's probably best not to put all the eggs in one basket of, of one particular you know champion city or primate city because we don't know what's going to, to happen to it as going forward. So. Thank you, John. There are many burning questions out here, but then I'd like to take advantage of being moderator and ask you one question. When you uh, talk about this, uh, like uh, uh, spectrums of uh, cities, did you do the analysis and saw like uh, if the reductions uh, actually there's a highly high level of correlations or you saw some bouncing across that area that's one and uh, second one is that uh, did you also do more heterogeneous analysis in the sense that how, uh, how what's like different uh, gender and uh, like let's say uh, like uh, groups uh, ethnic groups uh, kind of things, uh, ben benefits out of this growth. So did you also look at those kind of things? So, so the second question is a very good one. And no, we didn't. We didn't disaggregate the poverty results by, by type, of, type of household or, or type of person. Um, and that would be something which could be done uh, with a sufficiently rich data set. Indonesia would be reasonable to do that because of the, the you know, very high quality data we have from, from Susanas, for example. Um, the, set, the first one, yes, to a certain extent, particularly with Indonesia, we had referees who were asking, where are the results being driven by uh, Jakarta, Bandung, and um, who's the other third, the, the three big cities, uh, Surabaya. Uh, that are substantially bigger than all of the others that are sort of, you know, million plus cities and so forth. And no, they were not. It wasn't being disproportionately driven by one part of the distribution. Um, the drawback of trying to go too far to measuring the secondary towns, and this is a little bit specific to, to in the Indonesia case, is as you, as you set lower and lower thresholds, so you're getting basically smaller and smaller less dense settlements, um, more areas become less easily detected. And that's particularly the case in Eastern Indonesia, where of course the greatest poverty rates are as well. And so one doesn't want to sort of rely on assumptions because we can't measure so finely. So again, anyone who's interested in doing these kind of things, the, the more modern um, nightlights data that are set up with researchers in mind rather than Air Force pilots actually may be more suitable because they've got much greater um, resolution that they would enable us to more finely detail, you know, very low density, poorly lit cities versus uh, bigger ones, middle ones, bigger ones, bigger ones, so forth. And so that's really something for future work. I think we have to end, uh, sorry. Uh, that clock is not the correct. <laughs> so <laughs> three minutes going ahead, right? So. So in 1990s and 2000, people, uh, economists are uh, excited uh, about uh, the new theory called the spatial economics and the uh, Masa Fujita, Paul Krugman, and Anthony Benavos. Uh, they uh, made a very nice uh, general equilibrium dynamic uh, model of spatial economy. Is, is that the theory still alive? Uh, so looking at, after looking at a lot of data, how do you think? Let, let me give one very quick anecdote on this because many of you will know Yasu Sawada, who was my classmate at Stanford and Krugman was visiting Stanford at the time. I think Stanford was trying to make him a job offer and Krugman was giving lectures and it was so overflowing of students wanting to be on the new big thing that Yasu, certainly I was, I think Yasu as well, we were sitting on the ground. There were so many students coming into the lecture theater to see Krugman lecturing exactly, exactly on that. I think things like COVID have, have made people have a little bit of a, a, a rethink about um, um, basically the new urban geography. And, that. and similarly, the, the, the 
Richard Claridia uh, from the US and sort of the, the cultural aspect of it, because it was a large literature saying, you know, the big cities were the engines of sort of cultural growth, cultural diversity and so forth. And as people socially distanced, moved where they had possibility to move to lower density uh, areas, then I think there has been a little bit of a, a, a rethink and a questioning of that. Should we take one question from the floor, the last one? Because there are many, I'll, I'll just read one, the last one uh, from, it's, it's from our colleague Pradeep. If secondary towns are crucial for reducing poverty, what should the policymaker do while allocating public investment? Is it necessary to shift public investment to a secondary town from big cities to reduce poverty? So, so, so one of the first things to do um, is, to, is to make sure the data infrastructure can um, record the emergence of these. Right. So again, if we think of the standard sort of setup of, of an NSO, which will do field operations for a census 10 yearly. Um, not, so not a, not a well-resourced NSO that could do it five yearly. Then they will, they will be monitoring the growth of the, the, the places they already knew were urban because they need to, to, to create field teams, maps of expansion and so forth. But they won't really have the, the wherewithal to know about new secondary towns that are developing or the growth of places that previously were not above whatever threshold they used for treating something as an urban. And it may, maybe it's a population threshold of 10,000 and maybe it used to be 5,000, suddenly it's 25,000. They may not know about that for three, four, five years at all. So making sure that there's the that the mechanisms available and one low cost mechanism is using these kind of remote sensing tools to see that. Because once we can then detect it, then we can say, okay, what are the investment needs there? What are the constraints for people who are settling there? Are they settling there because it's a second best option because they would really prefer to settle somewhere else, but they can't. And in that case, we might want to still solve the, the, the first best problem rather than settle for the second best. And so all researchers will always say, you know, invest in more data. Uh, but actually in this case, I think it is a place where um, policymakers may only be partially informed because of the sort of built-in bias for the places we know exist as urban areas, but not the ones which are, are basically newly urbanized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor John. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, I think, call, call it off now. And, uh, but uh, before calling off, we'd like to, I'd like to extend uh, thank you from all ADBI colleagues and everybody who is attending your, uh, your, your uh, feature speaker series. We're very grateful that you, you have joined us we had always thought, we had uh, lots of uh, you know admirations of the work that you have been doing. I think most of us has read your paper, uh, many of your papers, and we have been keeping track of the work, the good work that we are doing. And uh, we are very honored that uh, we are able to see you in person today and also to hear you in person. And we look forward to you know like uh, meeting you more often and also like uh, maybe having you more often here at ADBI. And we are also very glad that you have taken the role of uh, the editor in chief of our journal, Asian Development Review. That's like, we are very proud and, uh, and, and, and we feel that under your leadership, we'll see that our ADR also will see different dimensions and we'll have greater impact factors soon. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, the pleasure was mine.